Hi everybody, I'm Michael. I'm here with Bruce Reed and the great team here at KCI Technologies in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we're gonna be talking about landscape architecture and some of the great things they're doing. So, y'all ready to dig in? Let's, Let's grow. grow. KCI Technologies is a very large firm. They're th throughout the United States. They have local offices here in Florida. They have this one here in Fort Lauderdale. You also have them in Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, Miami, and Fort Pierce? Fort Myers. Fort Myers. So that's, that's pretty amazing. They, they cover the full gamut of engineering services, yep. mostly for, for your needs. And this, this is a very large firm. They do a lot of big projects, but they also do some really cool projects like this park in the background that they're working on. So what I'm going to do is hand it over to Bruce so he can tell you a little bit more about his team here and then we're going to talk to some of the folks about some of the cool stuff they're doing. So Bruce, tell us a little bit about yourself and the firm. All right, landscape architect and I started uh, with the company over roughly about 30 years ago. Um, grew, grew up here in South Florida, uh, Palm Beach, Broward counties and um, it's an area I don't care to leave. I, I love it here. Um, and when I started working with this firm, I, I really enjoyed the type of work we do. We have basically every professional in-house, any type of development or preservation project except for architecture. And it's, it's just phenomenal to see how the inner workings of the different disciplines are used to develop a project. Yeah, I see that you design parks, streetscapes, master plans. A whole host, a whole host of things. That's it's very important too because when you have someone that has all that expertise in house, you can always you can hone in on getting your problem solved. So typically, when someone comes to a, to a firm, they have a want or a need, and how does the professional firm fulfill those needs? That's what we kind of want to touch on a little bit about KCI Technologies, and you also have a sister company. I think it's a surveying company in in uh, North Carolina. No, we're up and down the East Coast. Uh, th those are in-house services. Okay. And Great. Carlton, you want to touch base a little bit on the services that we do provide? Yeah, well, one of the, the things that you mentioned about being a full-service firm for landscape architects is that there is no problem too large or too specific we can't handle. And if you extrapolate that out to KCI's offices all the way from Maryland down to the East Coast, over to Texas, up in Tennessee, is that we have not just a diverse range of practices, but a diverse range of specialties, whether that's landscape architecture in this office or stream and pond restoration, port engineering services, MEP and specifically fire suppression services. Whether you need you know, uh, an environmental phase one on a gas station or a completely new park out of a vacant parcel, we have a team across the country that can pitch in and do all of that. Okay. Right. So that, that's really exciting that, that you guys touch on that and doing it um, at all in-house. That's super important. So that's one of the great things about being so full service and so large. Yeah, and when Carlton mentioned MEP, that's mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. That's, that's a, you know, a bunch of disciplines that are still housed in, under that acronym, but that's, that's a lot of folks, a lot of professionals that... By the way, I want to thank everyone here for taking the time especially Natalia because you know she's she, she likes to talk a lot and and so we're gonna make sure we give her some, some time <laughs> to talk but if I could um, if, if you want to add anything more Carlton if that's if, if that's a, a good overview I could go on and start talking to some some of your team Bruce and, and Carlton to well yeah I guess, I guess to highlight mm -hmm. um, specifically what we do here like Bruce said you know, we handle almost everything except the architecture. So we leave the buildings to the professionals and we take care of the rest of the land down here. And if you're a resident of South Florida, like, like I am for my whole life, like Bruce is, Me too. land is, Florida. land is, I'm from Pompano. So land is probably our most valuable and important resource and making sure that we use it efficiently, yes. uh, especially for our, from a municipality standpoint, is so vitally important that yes. they're investing their dollars in the right place and that their citizens are getting what they need out of it. So having the team here that can make sure everything is accurately surveyed, that we can put the data in a system that makes sense for our architects. Well, a lot of civil engineers like to put a bunch of pipes in the ground. We focus more specifically on how we can use current sheet flow to achieve Wonderful. drainage solutions. Yes. So these sort of yes. like reliable and sustainable things, we have that kind of national firepower, but the local expertise and the local you know, specificity of being 
the land development, the land specialist down here. Yeah. It's such a valuable resource, and making sure you get a firm that can and handle it appropriately is, is super yeah. important. That's why yeah. I love working with these guys. I, what just happened last month? Fort Lauderdale, that, that, that was crazy. We've never seen that much rainwater come down. Stormwater management is super important. I, I, don't, I was just amazed. I saw that, that storm just sitting there, and a lot of folks, and a lot of folks we've been getting some comments on, it's like, how do I, how do I deal with drainage issues and the sheet flow is great because then you can make this aesthetic. You can do cut and fill sure. and create something that becomes an asset that people can use and it also is recharging, filtering pollutants and doing a lot of good stuff. Yep. So it's really exciting that you guys touch on that and you do it at such a big scale that you can really move the needle on trying to help folks, especially South Florida, with, with um, our, uh, keeping our aquifer clean. So thank you, Carlton. Bruce, um, do you want to have anything more insights that you want us to talk about or we can talk to some of the folks yeah let's talk around. yeah let's talk to the folks learn about our team and kind of how we specialize if it's okay with natalia I'll wait for the end <laughs> we'll comment as we need to. okay so um how about kirk since i've worked with kirk in the past so obviously there's uh, many different facets of landscape architecture um we handle a lot of them here uh, my particular uh, specialty is transportation uh, it's a transportation super unique because you have limited maintenance. You have one of the roughest, you know, um, environments. scenarios, environments for uh, landscape. Um, and generally, you don't even have irrigation. Right. So you need to find, like, the bulletproof plants. Basically, you need to make it as sustainable as possible. Mm -hmm. um, the, the projects... They'll look good for several years, but eventually with no maintenance invasive start taking over. Um, it's, it's really tough with no maintenance at all to keep a project looking good for years and years to come. And then if you have slopes that are compacted for fulfilled with the soil, it's not the best. And so these bulletproof plants are, are super vital and, yeah. and important too. And so, you know, we have a, a list of kind of bulletproof plants, uh, both native and Florida friendly. So that's a thing that I was talking to Bruce earlier. Do you have like three or four of your favorite natives that you, let's just, trees and then understory. For what zone? For South Florida, <laughs> you know, 9B through 11. So for South Florida, um, I would say my favorites, I mean. We can do this as a group. Oaks are great, but I'm allergic to oaks, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's stick with some small trees. Uh, I love Simpson stoppers a tree. Yeah, they're great. It's great as a tree. It's great to um, grow orchids in there. Black ironwood, yeah. another great tree. Slow growing, yeah. uh, super. Doesn't get super big. Doesn't mm -hmm. get super big, super dense, great for hurricanes, strong wooded. Yeah. Um, Boston fern, native. Yeah, the native but I like the macho fern a little bit more. <laughs> I like macho, but macho native. fern's good. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Do you like the spike is Green Island? It's non native. But in meetings, I see it all through Miami Dade County. It's it's really tough. I've even seen it on beach it in Fort Lauderdale. The Ed Stone did, and they're they're hanging up with that salt spray, and people trampling over going to the beach, and they're still surviving. We, we did tough. a section of uh, A1A, and then used yeah. um, some green olive ficus with the coconuts yeah. and some silver buttonwoods, I think. And I think while it was in the establishment period, uh, in that one year warranty after it's installed, we had a hurricane come through and wash oh. sand all over it. And they eventually got rid of all the sand and cleaned up and all the plant material yeah. survived. Not, not one, I don't think one tree fell over. Yeah, but maintainability is, is so important. And if you don't have the right tree, right plant, right place, your design is going to fall apart over time. And that's super important. And I love that. Those are great points, Kirk. On the large projects, do you do a lot of detention and retention basins as part of uh, yes. the scope? Yeah, um, so drainage is, is obviously big on the side of the road, so you have the basically two zones, the impervious and the pervious. Right. And they try to maximize the amount of water storage they can have, um, so you have a lot of dry detention, um, which can make it a challenge to plant because, you know, you need something that's going to be able to adapt and, and um, be able to withstand maybe some standing water yeah. over time yeah. uh, and some areas stay wetter longer. Um, We've had know. success with pond apple. I've been playing a lot of that. That stuff is tough. 
Yeah. It's, uh, looks a little ratty sometimes, but it looks pretty tough. So. Needs, needs a good water supply. Yeah. yeah that's that's a we bottom love, of a retention. We love using uh, cypress. Cypress oh, is a great yeah. tree. Obviously, yeah. there's a couple of palms. And so we try to, you know, using that right tree, right place, uh, locate the water loving stuff in the lowest areas yeah. or the wettest areas. Um, and I would say to wrap up my favorite native trees, I, I love the, the slash pines. Yeah, oh, the drier areas. Yeah, right. And I love the the, nice. the cypress for. Uh, yeah, when they go in that the new spring flush and that green comes out, oh, oh it's so good. Well, they're yeah. sculptural, and pines are kind of sculptural too, so they yeah. give you that element. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So even in the winter when they're bare, they have a. They look maybe dead, but they have an interesting uh, yeah. structure. Yeah. Yeah. We, I was going to mention that we we get phone calls from the construction people regularly when a project is going in and they're cypress and it's the winter about why we're planting all the dead trees. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you get the, and you get that from the folks up north who, who migrate down don't have a problem with crepe myrtle. You can get that with a crepe myrtle some of semi deciduous, you know, but yeah, but that's a yeah, that's definitely a thing. I've I've had a lot of folks say, why why is this dead? I go, it's not. When you have yeah. four growing seasons down here, most stuff is not deciduous. I guess we get used to everything having leaves on. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, We're fortunate in many regards because we have this you know semi tropical environment. It's really really unique. It's really cool, you know. Um, so with that, if I could, have kind of rotate over and to talk to Todd a little bit about some of the stuff he's working on. Yeah, is there Todd, else? Todd has done. Uh, I'd say recently it's it's built and gone through the establishment, but probably one of my favorite interchanges now. Oh, really? So. I'm a landscape architect, 30 years along with Bruce. Actually, Bruce and I started working together back near the beginning of my professional career. So we've been um, either working together or, or been in communication for most of most of my professional career. Um, I worked in a multidisciplinary engineering firm for um, a little over a decade. I left for a little less than a decade and did um, water management um, nice. functions that are irrigation and large water users and management related. Okay. So central control systems and weather related water use for crops, uh, for orange oh, nice. groves and nice. that kind of thing. The project that Bruce is um, talking about is a transportation project um, and it's uh, it's over in the Tampa area. That's called okay. uh, Fowler. It was a very very large. Um, you know, trick. We think of the infields and interchanges. This one is a little unusual and, and really how how big it was. It had been cleared. We won't get into how or why because we never figured out why. Um, but it it had been cleared when we got to it. So oh, it, it literally was just scraped. So scraped any earth. of the any of the trees or stuff that could have been an asset that we could have reuse was taken out in the clearing and growing, which drives us crazy as LA's because yeah. there's an asset there and these trees are assets and palms and other natives are, that are there. But So we had a, we had a, um, a client with a, a, a vision for what he wanted in that interchange um, and, uh, and it was really exciting to kind of bring that to life. It was the most fill um, that I think I've ever Oh, so you had so you had your topography changes. So we we actually did both. So we we cut and we but we did end up in needing to import quite quite a bit because uh, the area was low. But we create the vision was to create um, sort of vignettes of of uh, the different ecosystems through. Oh, the so it started nice. off the beach and then went through nice. some, some wetlands uh, and, and then up through oh, all the, nice. you know, up into into uplands. Okay. Right? Um, so and it was, uh, it was how many acres would you say this interchange was? I'd say twelve. I bet it's, I bet it's twelve. It was yeah, one of the I think it was eight Wow, and a half it's acres. a big so I mean, you, had, you had four quadrants of this, or was it a special? Just, this was just one of the of the four. This was wow! Of the four. It was it's quite oh, quite large. Nice. Um, yeah, twelve, nice. 12 probably is about right. Um, but uh, but it was a lot of earth moving, so we used gabion baskets um, with, oh, with okay. limestone, and actually yeah. with a, with some imported a very small amount of imported rock as well to get dip, uh, change in colors and textures within the baskets. And we used a lot of limestone uh, boulders to create almost fieldstone walls. 
Batteries, nah, nice. wrap and all this material nice. that is obviously durable, nice. right? It's not not a lot that's going to go wrong with a rock. So uh, for those of you that don't know, we'll put putting stuff down here as we're going through the video, so you know what gabions are and the other stuff, so that you can you could understand a little bit what we're talking about in real time. But yeah, that's great. So, so yeah, I remember a project you did years ago. It was <laughs> it was down there at Seventy Ninth Street. I want to say ninety five, and you had some very large. That's right. That's right, the boulders. Oh. So cool. Yeah. yeah. We tried to and your action and we've we've been shot down several times, but but we've also been able to make them happen several times. A engineers, uh, for for good reason, don't like putting big boulders on slopes, yeah. right? Because yeah. they don't want them to roll. To, to roll. So, yeah. To roll. But I, I just thought it was brave and I thought it was right. it was cool. It was cool. I was like, yeah, there you go. Because it was like not what we typically see, you know. And you gotta push the envelope. Yeah. You don't want it. Right? You don't want to. You don't want to be play safe all the time. You, it's risk management. Everything in life yeah. is risk management. The way I look at it is just my personal view, um, and then also in the field of what we do is maintainability. And what Todd has just mentioned, which I think is so cool, is that you're you're putting the, the wetland plants where the wetland plant should be in this interchange, but you're also giving an experience, probably at what interchange at. You're exiting at 40, well, in my opinion, you're exiting at 90, <laughs> but, <laughs> but somewhere around a 45 mile an hour view shed versus a, a, a garden in your home or your, you know, in a, in a small park, you're going to have at walking speed. So you've got to, we have to design for those scales and yeah, scales. That, yep. that perception and then, and then making sure that the guys can go and maintain stuff. And, and when I was working back at my airport decades ago, we had a retention pond that they were redoing. And of course, I think civil engineer, I love civil engineers, but it came back with a box. And I was like, that's not going to fly. And we, we, we got the cut <laughs> I get it, fly, airport, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we changed the retention, but we also created almost like a drain because we had in-house maintenance at the time. Maintainability is so important. And at the, at the, the basin, at the lowest point, uh, let's just say it was at elevation one, uh, we, went, we had a, a shallow piece that went down to like 0.5. That was just enough for the truck the, that, that would stay wet the most so that they could basically mow the flat area. So pitched, pitched, and then we just had this little gentle piece at the bottom. It's just about six inches, but a, a wide area. You'd always see it when it was drought time because it was always the greenest. But that way our guys could mow it. But if we had several days of rain, that we didn't we didn't have a whole area that got out of control in Miami Airport it was so important for folks to to have this look good because there mm -hmm. are all these all these visitors visitors or people who want to invest and live down here so yeah. so that was our trick was that we did some of these in these large areas where where we dipped the very bottom part just a little bit not enough to really perceive but enough so our mo crew uh, didn't have to avoid this area they could mow in a lot of that that retention area or anything else I could maybe talk to. We'll tell you for last, but maybe Jerry on some things or Jerry, go ahead. Jerry, tell us a little about what you do here and some of the cool things you've been working on. Um, right now, about spent about half my time working for District Four in the uh, DOT. So I'm kind of like a little troubleshooter, inspector, that type of thing. And the other half, I do landscape inspections uh, for other projects. And on when you're looking for. For like trees and big large trees going in there. What are you, what on staking's been a thing that we, we've been bouncing around for years. What do you look at for staking a tree to keep them keep them secure for a year? Do you do you have a, a or when you're inspecting, do do you see firms that have certain standards that we were doing triple staking for decades and then a few of the ASLA conventions were, I don't think it was Gilman was speaking and they're saying maybe four stakes do it on four quadrants because we're tired of the storms. And, and kicking one out if one goes on a tripod, then the other two mostly fail. You see a lot of four stakes on large things like royals or big trees. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what we're going to now is four yeah. stakes on the big stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then for small stuff like a crate, you do two, two stakes to two, two stakes, three stakes, depending, yeah, depending on, on the size. Is, um, there's some other designs that I see come through that don't always happen because of different reasons but I'd like to see more staking where it's not so visible where you use oh yeah cabling or the uh, yeah. structure that holds the roots down. I was involved as a Chanel project that we did for our basket two years ago and they came to our team and there was a whole host from from Chanel to as Devlin to project and then hot screen the whole team of folks came there at Jungle Plaza in downtown Miami they turned it into a urban park 
and was of native pines and they used Lang Lang tree and some lemon trees that, that we at the, with the Parks Department were able to host and use and I designed where they went afterwards and we, we got hundreds of thousands of dollars of free free plant material that was only there for a little while but they used a cabling system that was really great because they had this paver block type system out of plastic that they put mulch on top but they were using cabling over the grow pots these like 100 gallon 45 gallon stuff cool cabling system which I could See when people do rooftop gardens and stuff, you don't want to necessarily see the stakes. And I was like, I was impressed by that that system. But um, before I forget, I wanted to ask you, what do you what do you think common mistakes people make or subcontractors make when they're installing plant material? Like you're saying that this isn't going to fly, that they could avoid. Very too deep. Planting too deep is number one mistake. Thank you, Natalia. Like I said, she's going to talk the whole time. I was asking Jerry, but but now you told me this answer. That's, okay. that's, okay. that's how we do. But, but she's so right. That drives me crazy, right? That's the simplest thing not to mess up, but they do it. Yeah. Why? They why? They've got a big machine, they overdig, then they put it back in and over the months or years, yeah. the soil subsides and the tree gets I'd rather it be off. two or three inches up, you're going to still have, yeah. that, that's going to settle most yeah. likely. And we tell them over and over again, and it's like, you, you can't stress it enough. And it's like, that is so bad for, for plant materials. I'd rather be high than low. Yeah. We, we do see a lot more um, of nursery stock, I think, coming to the site already buried. Yeah. Ooh. Or uh, container like, uh, yeah, stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. Especially um, container. I mean, it's very. I, it happens more often than not. I would say um, that when you're when you're dealing with trees, so you're already three you, inches deep. You kick it back on the truck, right? Don't you pull it off, or you just filter through the ones that look okay. And sometimes you don't have a choice, and you need to accept it, and you just have to take the top of the. You know, they oh, might kick have, out the soil. They it's might have four to six inches of soil on top of a hundred gallon container. Uh, uh, because it's so much easier to put soil on top than to yeah. replant a 100-gallon container into a 200-gallon container. Um, so they just put more soil in that way. Right. And I mean, that's and that's really bad. I mean, you're Absolutely. automatically planting too deep. Automatically. And, and, they're already, and they're already going through some stress when you're bringing them to the site because they're coming from the nursery where they're cared for day in, day out, and then they're transported and, you know, sometimes there's stuff about tagging. I wanted to ask you this. This just came to my mind. We used to tag in the field a lot back in the day. And then I stopped doing that with our team of LAs in the past because the contractor says you tagged it. Yeah, but you dragged it to the site off the back of your, of your truck without any netting on it. And it's wind burn. And, and then the, you, when you're pulling it off the truck, you broke some branches. So I say the final inspections when I is when we take it. You know, I, I will stop them if we see something glaring. But do you guys have that kind of approach where finally it's got to be final acceptance? We, right? We've taken an approach where we'll actually go out to the nursery and, and take some representative photos. Yeah. This is Good. what we're looking for. Good. Yeah. Because there were times where we yes. would tag stuff, and yes. then that's not the tree that would come to the site anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, either the contractor didn't put a deposit down, or they mm -hmm. oversold it. And so we just want some representative stuff and then we grade it at the site. I love how the bidders, when they're going out and bidding for a project for you all, and, they, and it's no mm -hmm. problem with the bid, and then they're saying, we can't source it. And I'm like, well, funny, you seem to source it during your bid process. You know, it's like, so uh, we're working with someone who was just trying to game the system and use something out of the nursery that we could, and it's not ideal, and it's, no. and, and we're on to those folks who, are, who do that because it's not, uh, yeah, and we know where you are. and and, and uh, so, but I, before, I want to ask you another question, Jerry, if I can. This is, this is great. Ground covers that you think that hold up real well, besides Bahia sod? Um, I'm pretty much focused on trees, and so ground covers, uh, the way I look at ground covers is they basically are kind of like, <laughs> they're kind of like the matting in a, in a picture, in a framed picture, uh -huh. so they, the they surround what you're looking at sure. and frame it out. Yeah. And whatever works for the site or what's needed on the site, sometimes the only thing you can put in is bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Different. yeah. Um, different, I mean, different job types, I think there are different answers to that. You know, yeah. re residential. Yeah, a nice um, commercial site. You can use Bermuda. People right. want to do that. Or and then, at, and then at the other end of the spectrum, like DOT right away. I, Bahia is the only thing that's going to live long term yep. there. It just, yep. in terms of, of short, you, you, yep. you, can, you can have success with trees and a very few, um, 
a very small number of, of I, I don't even want to say shrubs, I want to say a, a, you know, a less tall thing, either. Like firebush? Bull, those bulletproof things. Even, even that's thing. tough. It, it'll, it'll go a lot longer than a lot of others, but. Cocoa plum. Salt plum. Salt plum is great. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great native. I love, I love the silver version of that. Yes, yeah, so, so horizontalis is what is what the was. The cocoa plum. Yeah, that's great too. That's yeah. and Cocoa plum's really tough. You, that, Super tough. Talus, I don't know why the nurserymen are not growing it in large, large numbers because you, you do got to do a hunt and peck sometimes to get to so get the quantity. I think you, it grows slower, and so it's yeah, it's not. They're, they're growing the, the red tip mostly. Yeah, everyone loves it. I love it. I, mean, I, I, love I don't it. think they actually consider that one native. Depends on the setting. So I actually um, was talking to an owner of a nursery just maybe two months ago, and that and this subject came up, and actually. We were talking about horizontalis specifically, <clears throat> and he said it's hit or miss. He says I grow it, and then the demand completely oh, goes away, and uh, then I don't grow it, and yeah. everybody wants it. And he, yeah. and you know, they can't afford to grow a bunch of stuff that sits around yeah. for a long time. They, we need, had to, with they slash, need to move. We had that with product. slash pines for a while. We couldn't get them, and then we started specking them a lot, and then. And then they were, but people are still going to Central Florida to get the, the, the pines, you know, or, or north of, north of, um, you know, Pompano. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when, when demand is sporadic, it's, it's, it's harder for them to yep. take yeah. the risk to grow it. Yeah. <clears throat> for, for other, like, really tried and true plants that you see that do well over for maintainability, mm -hmm. do you have some in mind that, that, uh, You've seen this. It's, oh, this is this is pretty good. They, they, even when people don't do ideal maintenance, they're still kind of holding up. Or yeah, like passes. in one particular job we have down uh, Stock Island by Key West. Um, what is it? The indigo, indigo, bush? indigo berry, indigo berry. Yeah, uh, it's tough. completely and bulletproof. Yeah, yeah. drought, overwatering, yeah. whatever it is, it still yeah. stays the same. Yeah. Looks green. Great. Yeah, great that's, that's a that's a good one. I love that. Same thing with palm trees, though. Like when we were looking at you know maintenance requirements, are you going to have someone that's going to get up there and trim your palms, or, or do you want to specify yeah. maybe a self-cleaning palm? Yeah, that's going to drop stuff and look pretty neat all the time. Yeah, yeah, and that goes to the client needs. Sometimes it's specific if it's someone wants to have a specific look. But yeah, the the little sable palms, you know, that that's a. Or, Stay one tree. of my favorite palms, and I know a lot of people give it a bad name as the lollipop palm or whatever, but it's all in how you use it. Yeah, some with character that can be each, but yes, I, mean, I love the Florida thatch palm. Uh, well, the, for me, I love it. It's tough. Which one, the radiata or the Coco Thrinex? Well, the, the, the super expensive one is that one. Uh, yeah, but that, it's like it, it grows so slow. I, that's why I like it because everybody forgets about that one. That's something <laughs> we should use more. I, but it's just so expensive, and but yeah. but it's it's such a great, beautiful, beautiful understory. But there, if and it's especially if you're just thinking about not the, the large scale stuff, but at Miami Airport we had some rooftop gardens and we put native thatch palms in there and they stayed there for decades with hardly any we never changed the so soil out they yeah. just they just sit there and they hold up and they look great they tend to go through storms and stuff and they, they just did great and that, that's a plant i think or a palm that i think is really tough that i don't i see it's a lot but not as much as i thought people would use more of it in 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 certain you know projects where you need something more middle, lower scale because it's not a it's a medium stature palm but yeah Key thatch palm is one of my my favorites, wow. um, but it's again it's it's a very specific. It's so slow that, yeah. that you know you've got to um, depending on what space it's going into, you may have to spend a lot of money to get it large enough to where yeah. it's large enough for you to either walk under or whatever. And, and if not, it'll be a it'll be a couple decades before you. The buy scale of those is, 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 is really good, you know, for yeah. small areas because they're smaller palms; they stay small. Mm -hmm. Uh, but even what we were just talking about this, um, and they're not natives, but Florida-friendly palms. You got the the Bismarcks and the Latanias. Mm -hmm. So the Latania looks, the like baby Bismarck, looks like a baby Bismarck. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So much more mm -hmm. manageable yeah. versus you yeah. know, putting a, a Bismarck in it. It's going to get hard to maintain, hard to trim. Where you need a yeah. bucket truck. I mean, but it, they're it's spectacular different. looking. I mean, they're just these bold statements. But, but you know, it's the right you know, plant, right place. But that's yeah, that's a really good. Thing about well, one of the other good things is is that 
what I see we do here and, and a few other people do is you don't plant all the palms at the same height. You get some 20 yes. foot, some 10 foot, yes. you put some in at a, you know, like a 10 gallon size. So it looks like a more natural setting. When I knew nothing right out of college, I worked at Stressall Smith and Stressall. That's my first place and Fred, the, the son of the, the owner of the firm, was taught me about palms and he would put the tallest palms out in front and I'm like why but that way you could see the palm and then he put medium and other ones behind it and, I, and it wouldn't it would he would do it for a 360 so you'd have that mix and I thought that was so astute I was like I, and I never forgot that I was like well, it was my first like, it was like my first month so I go there and my lunch back in the day was was a Snickers bar and a super big gulp of coke <laughs> and I come in and say hi to too. the boss I'm newly hired and the lid separates and the cup hits the carpet and comes out like a volcano. And I go, well, I'm fired, I am fired. <laughs> and he took his glasses off and he goes, God, me and in every cuss word. And he didn't fire me for four years. I don't know how, <laughs> thanks for not firing me all those years. <laughs> that, was, that was it, but he, I learned that from him. And I love when I, I saw some of his stuff well, years later. And, and, and if you be strategic with your design, you can create such interest. And again, it's to scale, like to what Todd was saying, is that if you're going at a faster speed, if you jam too much in there, it's just gonna be a blur. You have to have these void pocket areas to allow those views through and, and in and out of spaces. But yeah, I'm so glad that Bruce, that you guys have this wonderful team here that can do so much. Yep, one of the newer things that we've kind of gotten into is the wildflower program. And Jerry's uh, been a key part of that. So, so. Um, yeah, that's a district, it's a statewide project that I'm, uh, kind of running it for District 4. Okay. And so we've had a couple of years, I'm, this is the third year we've done it. We're uh, gonna be starting the new year in January. How many districts do we have in Florida? I can't recall. Well, <laughs> the turnpike is eight. Eight. Wow. I mean, central office is nine. Central mm -hmm. office, yeah. wow, okay. So, so, so what are some of the ones I'm, I'm keen to know about that? Because I've seen it do well, I've seen wildfires do well in central Florida, but not down here as much. But the, are there some? The thing is, is that there's very few native wildflowers that are big enough to be showy so that you're going to see going by at 100 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you have to have either a huge bed yeah. or you have to have just the right species. Yeah. Um, so inevitably we get in things that aren't native because they have color. Yeah, uh, but that's fine. It, it's, yeah. it's naturalized and it's not invasive. Um, yeah. Bedelia again, right? Like, I did. That's tough as tough. I wish, tough. I wish we had a native that was tough as, as Bedelia. Come on, right? Yeah. I know. It's like, and it's like, if there just could be a way. Sometimes you just want something to hold up because you can put all that ass, all that money all, uh, that goes into a project, and in, and in five years you look back and you're like, that just all died out. Perennial peanut. I loved it when it first came out, but now I'm on the fence with it because it, I can see it do great uh, for a while, and then it will yellow out real harsh and I don't know if that is a, a component of just the, the landscape medium that it's in but it stays very low like a carpet you get those really cool buttercup yellow flowers mm -hmm. but I don't know if you all had good success with uh, that or do you shy away we just, we just interacted on a project where that was specced on the roundabout down at oh. on Coral Way okay so I recollect you looked at those plans for somebody um, and gave us some comments oh <laughs> but um but I wonder yeah well, I we we have um, and we went through the same exactly what what you're talking about where it was the new plant on the scene right yeah. and, and everybody's it was super low it. super and, low and, and for us in our world that was you know that's the the holy grail yeah yeah and um, and yeah it's been a struggle it, it's it does much better um, the, the, the alkaline soils down here are particularly yeah. difficult for yeah. it, I think. Um, and most of our projects get so little maintenance that you're not getting fertilizer. Yeah. You're not yeah. going on to good soil to begin with, and so it's a challenge. It holds Where, up. It holds up pretty good for a while, and it, it knits tight so you can control the weeds that want to come up over it, which I liked about it. But then when it doesn't do so well, then the weeds come weeds. up over it, and then you start to get this and it stays so low, then it's pronounced and you see the weeds in that group and you're like, ah. Yeah. And maintainability, that's like a huge, huge thing. Yep. We want our projects to do really well over the long haul. And, and yeah. I would say the good thing about it though is you could mow it. Yeah, it's low. Very yeah. unlike another shrub, you could just yeah. mow it. No harm. If it's not 
Yeah. That's true. You can go right over the, right over. Yeah, and it's even if you run over the size of it with the wheel, it's still going to bounce back. Cause it's, so on, on wildfires, do you have some that you you uh, like a, um, a lot that have done pretty well? The Coriopsis Leavenworthii. Okay. That's that's like the holy grail. Um, it's expensive because there's not a lot of people who grow it in bulk. So yeah. it's like two or three times or sometimes more than that of the regular wildflowers that you might get per pound for seed. So when you think of railroad vine, I did a project in Venetian Causeway for for some folks taking because uh, the ground covers died and it took off and, and it it took off. <laughs> Literally it took <laughs> off. And I'm like, you know what? Good for nature because they had the budget to maintain it and it would go over the end of the bull noses. But these things were flowering all the time and it formed a tight knit. And I was like, and it covered a lot of real estate for not a lot of plants. And I was like, I don't know if it's just that it did well because we're in that right beach like condition. It'll grow uh, on the beach though. So that's not a thing. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's hard to contain. It just says that those long runners might go 100 feet in a week. Right? Yeah, but if you trim them, what we found is that they start doing this and doing that. So you start to, if you get the maintenance up there and you trim them initially in the first group where you have containment edge, then they start to fill in because then they shoot back on themselves. And that's what we were finding out. And I was like, well, it's something that stayed relatively low, but it, it can climb a little bit. I saw it start to climb up some of, the, some of these canary and just palms a little bit, but not like a pothos, you know, but that's cool. Any any other um, wildfires that you really like that? Let's uh, talk maybe further north, because there's folks that, that, that stop by our channel that are in nine. And, and yeah, this year we had cosmos, which worked very well for okay. us. Uh, the orange variety mm -hmm. that worked very well, and so in the coming year we're going to try uh, a different cosmos that has like red, light, and blues in it. So we're going to alternate different fields. Oh, nice! Yeah. Nice. So one will be orange, hopefully, and one will be red, white, and blue. Oh, cool. Sure, Natalia. You know, one thing she adds to our team, I think, it's great is. Um, a very broad perspective on the design. Um, she can. It's amazing how quickly she can formulate a you know a large scale project into the the simple things. I think Natalia. I work with Fred. You do. I work with Ed Stone. I okay. Started. I still work with Fred. Oh yeah. yeah. Trying to get out of that Fred. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know is. Uh, it's great to work with, and I don't know if she has any tips as far as the, you know, maybe somebody just getting in, trying to do their own design work, and, you know, how to simplify things or phase them or anything like that. Design is, I don't know, I, it just comes natural to some people, yeah. but you can learn, yeah. but studying history is mm -hmm. important in design. Yeah. You had mentioned that Fred does something planting the big tree and smaller ones in the background. That also gives you the idea of larger depth, depth right? Mm -hmm. The French would do that all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's studying history and design. So if you know why they did it, you can repeat it. Um, I came to landscape architecture through, I opened a nursery with my family. Oh, so nice. I have that perspective. I love yes. this profession because you're a problem solver. The mm -hmm. last thing we deal with is trees. Yeah, yeah. We solve That's everything exactly else. Right. You, you, people come to us with a need or a want and the very next thing is that I ask is okay for your, for your need and want. Let's define that scope and then how much are you willing to separate financially because there's a dollar component and then how do you navigate all that through from the various design processes we go through to 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 ultimately to permitting and then bid and bid and install unless you're doing it um, at all in-house that's super important and that's one thing I wish people would have takeaways to be have realistic goals some people come with with these ideas and then they give you the shoestring budget and first thing I, I say is it's like no this isn't gonna fly and then here are the reasons why and then they can come back and say well let's just package this into to phases Let's package this or winnow down some of this and, and maybe you don't go with with sizes of certain the trees can be a little mm -hmm. bit lower as long as it means code and you and you let this grow over time. But but yeah, that's So that's with great. like a project like what's behind you. Yeah, this is beautiful. The client 
very nervous as, you know, how much is this going to cost? Well, I could make it Ritz Carlton, right. or I could make it, the spaces are there. It's whether you build it to last, yeah. or if you want a, the Disney effect and have everything full grown to size, it's going to cost you more if mm -hmm. it can grow over time. Or a blender too, and your focal, right. and focal points go with a feature that's there and the other exactly. stuff that, that can grow in over time. But phasing, have, phasing is yeah. important. But to have that background in nursery and plant material to bring that forward from that, because I didn't start that way. I fiddled with plants when I was younger and stuff, but not know what the, the, the growers have and what's coming new. You know, I'm always interested that perennial peanut we talked about coming onto the scene and, and stuff and other plants to try and test so that we don't get caught into this box of like, but sometimes we just have to do that because that's what's going to be maintained. The Sonora weapons. Yeah, I love that because it's saw palmetto. You don't even trim it. You just let it do its thing. Slow growing. I think yep. you had that at your, one of your first homes. You had that. I have it at my house now too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is called going to be locked. This is going into Todd. Going to be built soon or into so they are doing phase one uh, of the project, um, which is just the remediation of the lake. So they're going to cap all the sediments in it and eradicate invasives, basically. Nice. And um, and then they'll have to see where the program goes. Okay. So, but the the master plan is done. Um, That's great. And so they have a they have a they have a tangible representation of what some of board wants to do mm -hmm. and then so they can use that to sell it and to, to you know partner boats and but what, what a what beautiful happens. project in that you have something that was that was not helping the community in any way and we're, we're fixing that that issue with the environmental side and then bring something back to the community that can be this beautiful oasis that people can enjoy well, and if that isn't you know that's kind of exactly what we do and in, in as designers and and as experts in our field is to try to bring these bring these values to the to the to the consumer or the, or the park patron or or the client you know yeah and just like you mentioned I mean when we first we went on the initial site visit after we talked with the um, the owners of the project and when we went back we pulled up in two separate pickup trucks and had to get out and unlock a gate that had invasive species growing all up and down the sides it was completely inaccessible and he opened it up if you think about this locked off old remediation pond that no one was allowed to go oh. visit into what you see behind you which is going to specifically be a community engagement center wow like if that's not the the transformative power <laughs> yeah. of yeah. what we do here yeah yeah, yeah. for yeah. sure yeah because yeah. you see this walled off area that just looks like you know this like no trespassing <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you're not going to come out of there alive to, right. to something like this yeah that that's wonderful so i I want to thank everyone who's who stopped by to join, and especially the team here. You guys have been awesome. Bruce, thanks again so much Appreciate for taking it, Mike. the time. So until the next video, see you later. Bye. Please remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And tell your friends and family. We post videos weekly. Thanks.